Um, okay, um, let me go ahead and get started today. Um, so, I haven't had anybody arrive yet. Uh, my plan was to see if anybody had any questions about uh, probably the second problem set and second program assignment. So, um, last uh, Monday we did review test one, um, although, again, if, it's, if some people do show up here and, and want to ask some things about the test, our last program assignment, um, that's fine. Um, hopefully everybody has, has had a chance to review those, um, especially the test uh, written question. So, um, so yeah, this might be a, a relatively quick session. Um, I, I was thinking about getting started on the second program assignment. So showing the example start of that. So I might do that a little bit um, and then repeat as well. Um, next week, um, which um, hopefully, you know, again, if, if you are, are not getting started with these, even in the, the first of our three weeks for these units, um, you really at least should be reading over um, and, and uh, beginning to understand what the simulation is going to be uh, for the assignment of that week, you know, if not getting started on it. So I know a couple of people have started on number two already, which is great. Um, all right, so let me see if, if there's there was one or two things maybe I can say about the problem set. So I was going to give hints or see if anybody had questions on these. Um, I don't know if, I mean, the first one shouldn't take you too long, except, so let me point out, so this is supposed to be about for question, uh, figure 3.9 from our textbook. So this is a really important diagram. Maybe I should uh, bring this up here. So um, I'm going to bring up my copy of the textbook. Um, so uh, in my, I think I got uh, version seven of the textbook here. Um, you know, this is a um, figure 3.9 is, is an important one to understand here in chapter three. So, oops, that way. Um, Let me see if I can find it here. So, so um, all, all the things about the uh, the the states and the state transition um, diagrams. Um, I was probably hearing process states here is, is, is where it talks about these. You know, so um, I, I talked a little bit about these in my lecture videos, oh, and I've had some people join. So, um, you know, if you guys have any questions, I'm, I'm just going over some stuff. But feel free to interrupt or, or ask if if you have some specific uh, things that you're working on or need some help with. So. Um, but yeah, this unit is all about processes and threads. So um, kind of a very important thing in chapter two is to understand the, this idea of process states and kind of this buildup from you know the, the basic, the most basic state you can have for uh, for processes being managed by an operating system is you know you keep track of which process is the current running one if you're thinking mostly of a single CPU system versus you've got some sort of a list or a queue or some other structure that has all the ones that are not currently running right and again I believe I covered all this in my um, um, lecture videos this week hopefully so um, but uh, really kind of they don't have a diagram just of a three-state process model but uh, you could imagine a three-state process model because things that are um, not currently running there, there's two distinct ways that you might not be running so you might not be running but you you're you are ready to run you know so i could immediately run um, if the operating system would pick me to run right but some processes though um, and, and this is kind of one of the whole reasons why we have this concept of processes for operating systems. So some processes might not be ready to run because they are in, currently in the middle of doing some I.O. operation. Okay, So the main reason why we implement processes in operating systems is um, an efficiency argument. So, you know, it, it's very often if we're running a program that um, it's going to be I/O bound, so it needs to do a lot of I/O, like reading or writing to disks, just uh, as the most typical, right? Um, and I/O is very slow. I mean, just to to, to finish one I/O operation takes many hundreds or thousands or millions of machine cycles, typically. You know, millions is not so. If, if you waited, your CPU would just be waiting around for for millions of cycles doing nothing. It could actually be doing useful work. Okay, 
So the biggest thing about processes is, well, th th this idea that instead of waiting, if, if I've got more than one process, you know, so, so if I can enter, uh, if I can um, implement what's known as a multi-programming system, one that supports multiple processes running, um, I um, can, um, if one process is blocked or needs to block to wait for some IO, maybe I've got multiple processes and I could switch to another one. Maybe right now another one is ready to run and I switch to it. So that way I can keep the CPU doing useful work while at the same time in parallel, um, IO is being carried out for other processes that are waiting on it to get the read of the write. So. Um, anyway, so, and, and that's really what the three state diagram, three state process model, and then five state we just add in because in reality, for the operating system to manage processes, uh, when it first creates a new process, you might want to have it in a distinct state while you're allocating memory for the process and setting it up and doing all those kinds of things. You know. Likewise, when a process ends, uh, you might put it in an exit state because there might be cleanup that you have to do. You have to deallocate its resources, maybe send information back to the parent process that created the process about how the process terminated, um, other stuff like that. So then finally, kind of that was all of an aside. The, uh, the, the, for the first question for our problem set, um, it's referring to, uh, actually it's referring to 3.9b here, the one with the, the seven full states, right? So there's, there's um, seven full states here. So basically we, we extended the five state to add in this concept of being able to um, suspend and unsuspend processes, okay? So one one thing, you know, I, I, a lot of students that take this course, um, get a bit confused between the difference between blocking and unblocking versus suspending and unsuspending. And these are totally different things. I say so for the one blocking or unblocking is about waiting for IO. So, so initiating um, input output um, and um, completing it. The other is all about memory management. So if the system is overloaded, I've got two, me memory is a critical resource. Um, if if I don't have enough of it, I might want to completely select one or more processes to kick them out. That's known as suspending a process so that it doesn't have any um, need for memory resources. So, so I can kick it out, freeing up some memory for the, the, the processes that, that I leave in memory, not suspended, uh, to have more memory and to be able to do things, okay? So anyway, back to the problem set. Um, if we have seven processes here, there's really 42 possible state transition diagrams and not all 42 are shown here, right? So this only shows, you know, maybe 10 or 12 um, possible transitions. So for example, it doesn't show the transition from new to exit, right? So why is there 42? I mean, hopefully if, if you disallow um, self transitions, Right, and and you might want to think about was well, so a why would you disallow? Does that make sense to disallow those or not? But but not thinking about a transition from new back to new, uh, new can transition to any of these other six. So I could possibly there's only two shown, but besides these two, there's four others: new to block suspend, new to blocked, uh, new to running, and new to exit. So that's the total six, and every one of these seven could potentially go to each of the other six. So that's why you know six times seven is forty two, right? So anyway, for this for this first question, you really should list out all 42 possible ones. So so if you don't have a list of 42, and and, and even be helpful to me, I mean number them one, two, three, four, and, and have the complete list, or make it very clear that you've covered all these, and, and, and you're supposed to cover all these, um, and break them into two general categories: the ones that make sense, so so possible transitions that might be useful, right? Um, and the ones that don't, okay? So there's some, and, and, and this isn't like uh, hard and fast. I mean, you can argue some of these one way or the other. It would depend on the goals of the operating system, some other things, right? But there are some, you know, that, that, that definitely do not seem useful under any kind of real circumstance, right? So, 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 and you should describe that, right? So if you list something as impossible, you ought to be telling me, well, does this seem completely um, 
unuseful, right? So you can't think of any situation, or could you describe a situation, even though you say it's, it's not useful, it's impossible, but perhaps in this kind of operating system or this kind of circumstance, maybe it would be useful and it would be a valid transition, right? So there could be some that you list sort of in between, right? Um, all right. The second one might be a little bit more difficult, um, or at least take you a little bit more time. So you do need to look at this um, program that uses threads. So this is kind of supposed to be related to chapter four on threading here. So this is beginning to talk about um, threads in a program. In this case, uh, just to go over this relatively quickly, uh, actually, uh, I'm not going to go over it here in, in the code here. So uh, one other thing I wanted to point out is that um, in your dev box environment, um, um, under the examples, I believe it is, we do have um, this code that will compile and run for you. So let, let me check if that's true, but it should be there. So let me close off uh, everything here. There's probably a shortcut key to like close off all open windows and Visual Studio Code, I'll bet, instead of clicking all these individually. Um, so yeah, under your, um, in your repository, there should be an example directory, um, and in particular, there should be one for problem set two. Um, So I believe the one named promset 2 race um, has the code as you had it in your problem set, okay? So real quickly to, to describe what this does, this is an example of a thread programming using the pthreads library, which is a, a common library used by C and C++ programs for threading. Rel relatively old, um, so it's not object-oriented, so it's, it's all based on calling functions, so it's a, a function call API for th creating threads and managing threads within a program. Um, so basically what happens is you, you, when you start executing a program, uh, normally the operating system starts up a new process with a single thread in it, and that single thread is running the main function in here. And the, the the result of calling pthread is it creates a second a second thread within the um, process context. Okay, so, so this calling pthread create once uh, creates thread number two. And in this case, um, you know, to, to unpack this, um, it actually returns some information that we don't use, but, but the important thing is the fourth parameter here. This is the name of a function. So the second thread is actually going to start executing and be executing the function that you specify, in particular this thread function. Okay? So after this function returns, assuming that we didn't get an error, right? So if it returns a non zero code, that's an error code and we just abort immediately. But um, if it returns zero, that means no error. So after this point, I've got two threads running. One thread is going to be main running this loop. Um, and one thread is going to be, the, the thread that we just created is going to be running this function, which runs this loop, okay? So these, these two threads will be running uh, in parallel, all right? And the operating system could switch between them because when you have multi-threaded uh, programs, the operating system can schedule on the threading level. So it can choose to run one thread for a while and then um, um, that thread gets uh, maybe timed out or goes to a block state, uh, and then it can run the other thread for a while, and, and it can jump back and forth between those, okay? So I should have a make file set up, so you should be able to do control shift B to build. Um, if you've never built in there before, um, you know, it'll probably actually have to build. Let me, let me do control shift C to clean everything. Control shift B. And then you'll, you'll have to run this by hand. So in this particular case, it should create, yeah, it creates um, a um, executable called PS02 for the problem set 02, and it creates some others that I'm not gonna talk about until after our problem set here. 
Although, you know, if you want kind of the answer to the problem set, if you sort of look at some of these other versions, uh, that gives you some uh, some kind of actual answers to the question for our second question on the problem set here, right? So um, I'll just create another terminal here. So that built. Um, that built in my example directory called ps02. Uh, we should see these executables. In particular, ps02 um, should actually run and get you the same. Uh, by the way, so you won't get exact, you won't necessarily get exactly the same output. Right? So this is the output. Um, oh, um, I don't know why I changed that to plus instead of O's. Um, I should probably change that back. So it, it shows O's and dots. So that means that we just change the um, output. Um, so in both of these loops, inside of the loop, um, it outputs a character. So every, every every iteration to the loop, it outputs an O. If it's this thread in main that's running, and it outputs um, a period here, or well, outputs a plus unless you. Uh, change that back to an O, right? So let me rebuild that. And um, run it again. So there we go. So um, yeah, you might be more likely to actually see it, um, you know, be, be do complete, um, um, uh, iteration back and forth between the two threads. So always switching back from the main thread to the uh, to the uh, the function thread main function. So, so here we, we did you know kind of perfect um, switching. We never ran uh, iterated through the loop more than once before we stopped and, and switched to the other one. Right. So that doesn't necessarily have to be the case. Um, right. And um, uh, kind of as the output showed here. I mean you can get uh, if you run it multiple times, uh, this will depend on the speed of your system and, and kind of the operating system and stuff. So it might be not as likely to see um, uh, multiple iterations through a single one because they're both doing a sleep here, um, I believe. Yeah. So, but yeah, so, so, so keep that in mind though. So, so even though you do get this, I, you might not always get them iterating back and forth perfectly from one to the other. Um, and um, also, you know, pay attention to the final value of this variable called my global being 21 here, right? Is that expected or unexpected? Uh, yeah, if, um, if you comment out the sleep, um, the behavior will be a little bit different. Uh, and you'll be much more likely to see it run. In fact, you might see it run all of of one, all iterations for one loop for for one thread first, and before it switches over to the other. Uh, let's see if that's true. So, so it should run much quicker. Yeah, and then without any kind of uh, sleep, you know, it pretty much the. Um, runs all of, of the main first and then it comes over and runs all that one. So that's not too interesting, but um, I can't remember if you can do like um, specify fractions to get less than one second sleep or not. I have to read the man page for the sleep function. Let's try it, see if we can sleep for a hundredth of a second. If it, so that actually compile. With less sleep time, you'd be more likely to see it um, uh, repeat some iterations before switching to the other thread, I believe, probably. Um, yeah, compile, but yeah, I don't know if it's doing that or just using, like, uh, changing that to an integer, in which case it would still be doing, like, a sleep of zero, maybe, or something. So, yeah, uh, well, yeah, maybe that is doing what I'm saying. So, yeah, so, so there. Um, Assuming that that is sleeping for a little bit, you see that um, you get much more of a variation in the um, 
the switching between the two threads. Uh, so. All right. Um, yeah, and that was kind of all the hints. Unless uh, I mean, I was, I was hopefully some people were gonna ask some questions. We still have some time on Monday to ask some questions as well. So, but yeah, that was problem set two. Um, and let me get started then. Let's let's start looking at assignment two. I guess I'll probably completely repeat all of this here um, on Monday again as well, um, as people start thinking probably more seriously about the second assignment. Uh, we'll, we'll bring up the description here first. Um, so in assignment two, we're actually gonna be building a process state simulation um, so it's really simulating an operating system having a, a process uh, entity and a process table so, so a table or a list of processes that is managing and then simulating the processes changing through kind of main, mainly the three main states so ready running and blocked okay and you have to implement round robin scheduling so basic round robin scheduling so meaning that uh, when the CPU selects is ready to select the next process to run. There needs to be a ready queue, um, so there needs and, and there needs to be some way of, of finding out, specifying which process is currently at the head of the queue, which means it's been waiting the longest. Um, and then the dispatcher, you know, our simulation of the dispatcher in this case, should select that process to be the next uh, one that's running. Okay? But we also simulate uh, blocking and unblocking on I/O as well. Um, in this simulation here. So, um, all right, so let me describe um, the way the simulation works. The input files for the simulation are a set of kind of events, and then we, we execute events in, um, in uh, discrete time steps, okay? And then actually, the only time that the system time runs is every time a CPU event happens. So this represents the execution of a CPU cycle. So initially, your system time or your system clock will start off at zero. So after this, one CPU cycle will happen. So now system time will be one, and then two, and then three, and then four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. So only like 15 CPU cycles would happen for this first um, simulation here. But in between a cycle, sometimes um, other events can happen. So in between a clock cycle, like a new process could be created to enter the system. That's what the new does. Um, or uh, a block could happen. So that represents that um, at this point while executing the, um, the, the code in the CPU, whatever the current running process is, it performed an IO operation. So it has to block, right? So instead of that process timing out, it needs to be put into a block state waiting on IO. And, and likewise, you can get a, a corresponding unblocks right? and they block on a particular, you know, this is just made up, but they block on, you can think of this like, you know, each, each unique ID means a different disk or a different type of I.O. So maybe, maybe 83 is, you know, blocking to read um, on disk one of the system or something like that. So, um, and there's a couple of others. I think there's a complete list of these. So did we cover all of them? CPU, I should make that lowercase because, because they're lowercase. Um, oh yeah, so uh, there, there's the done that we showed one of. Um, oh, these aren't the events. These are um, these are kind of the events, but but you don't have dispatch and timeout. Uh, you have to infer these. Um, so you have to time out any time a process exceeds its time slice quantum. So so to simulate time slice um, and, and round robin time slicing in the system, there's going to be a defined um, what's known as a time slice quantum. So every process, when it first starts running, when it's first dispatched to run the CPU, uh, will, will be set to be given a number of time slice quantums to run. And once it's run those time slice quantums, it should time out automatically, right? So you don't get that as an event here like you do for block and unblock. Um, um, part of the simulation has to keep track of, you know, when it runs out of its time slice quantum, at which point it needs to be timed out. And send back to the ready queue. 
Um, and, and likewise, um, uh, if a CPU is idle, you know, we have to have a dispatch. So, so basically, if, if you come and you're ready to do a CPU cycle and no process is currently running, um, a dispatch action has to occur, which mainly needs to look at your ready queue and if there is a process ready to run, to dispatch it, to, to take it off the ready and become the running process. Okay. So that is in a nutshell what this um, um, simulation is about. Um, so in this simulation, you're mostly only going to be changing. I think you're, you're I mean, you, you might be able to put some code into process state, uh, but I don't think that, oh, and, and process, but mostly I don't think so. Um, you know, it, might, it depends on how you implement things. So you might have to, this one's a little bit more open-ended than the first one. So it could be useful for your approach to maybe add some things to the process and the process state, uh, in which case, you know, you're welcome to do that. But for the most part, everything you're going to be adding is new methods to the process simulator, kind of like the hypothetical machine simulator from assignment one. So let me um, um, just real quickly uh, introduce these. So process defines a class that represents a single process. So this is, um, um, so if you look in there, there's going to be uh, just a, a class declaration. If you look in the header file, um, so, so this is really in our chapter three about processes, kind of things that our simulated operating system needs to keep track of in order to manage the processes in the system. So things like the process identifier, what state it's currently in, uh, when it started, how much time it's currently used, uh, the time quantum, so simulate time slash quantum, uh, round robin scheduling, uh, we keep track of the time slash quantums used on the process. Um, if it's blocked, so if it's in a block state, we have to keep track of which event or which I.O. type it's waiting on uh, to unblock on. All right. um, and then process state is even simpler. So, so process processes can be in a particular process state, and we define that um, in the process state.hpp. So again, this is this is supposed to be an example of doing kind of good programming. So you know, we don't just define like integers one, two, three for ready, run, and block. We define a whole enumerated type. Right, so this is the correct way to define when, when I have a type that represents a discrete set of things, like, like you know, day of the week, uh, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. You should really use an enumerated type. So, so here our process state. We've got. Uh, we're really going to. Um, you mostly really only need the ready, running, and blocked, but uh, we also have the new and the done here as well. Right. And we overload some other things for convenience, but but really is, this is relatively simple. That's just the process state. And so when you set a process or when you transition a process from like ready to running, you're going to be you know changing that state you know to to change it from one to the other. So. And actually, you don't have to do a lot of that by hand because the process is given to you, um, um, it actually already has some functions defined. So you, you're mostly just going to be calling these functions on process. So if, if you're ready to, if, if your simulation determines that this process should be dispatched, you just call dispatch on the process, right? And if your CP, if your simulator is ready to run a CPU cycle, um, and you know this process is the one that's currently running, you need to call CPU cycle. On that process to have it simulate executing one CPU cycle, right? So, like I said, um, you probably won't have to add anything into those two. We'll mostly be doing the process simulator. Uh, I'm going to open up that and also the implementation file. So in this assignment, I gave you the process simulator class, and I gave you um, data members, um, so, so um, uh, member variables for our process simulator. But uh, in this case, I didn't give you all of the um, data members that you need. In, in fact, you're going to have to add in a process control block. Um, and yeah, I might already have some code in this. That, um, so, so you probably don't have that process control block. Let me um, try um, 
Let me try restoring here, um, just a second. So, I'm going to uh, use git to restore back to what should be in the repository. So, um, Also restore the test as well, just in case I've modified those. There we go. So let me open that up again and see. Yeah. So this is probably all that you'll have um, initially. So we define a few things, uh, but you're going to have to add in some actual uh, data members this time for like your queues um, and lists. Um, and, and, you know, you might need to have like a, an array or something for your uh, process table, things like that, okay? I described some of those in the um, assignment description. So, so um, let me open up the tests here. Actually, I'm gonna go and close the process state and the process because we don't need those right now. Um, and kind of like I like I usually do, uh, and like I said, I'll probably redo this on Monday. But um, let's let's just kind of work through the first task here. So the process simulator is is a simulation really of a full operating well not a full it's a simulation of the the scheduling and dispatching part of an operating system. So the creation and management of processing of of processes. Um, um, you know, with like a process table and a ready queue and um, simulating um, uh, transitioning processes through the, uh, the the five main states. So we don't have any swapping in this. So we're not simulating uh, process suspension and unsuspension. So only uh, ready running and blocking of, of processes here. Um, so um, the initial things is to, to just implement some of the getter functions. Um, so we didn't give you the implementation of the constructor for the process simulator class, so you'll need to start with the constructor that specifies the system time slice quantum and saves that value, all right? Um, so let's, let's look at what we mean by that, okay? So um, if we look at the very first um, uh, oh, the very first test case is just some tests of the process. Okay, so these should actually all be passing. So if I do a better do a clean, I better build this here because it'll take a while to get the test built as usual. But yeah, the, the, the first test case is all testing processes. Um, so you shouldn't have to do anything, and hopefully those should all be passing. Um, so it'll actually be the second. You have to go down to the second set of test case. So here is where we. Um, first start testing some of the member functions from the process simulator. So in particular, I haven't given you the um, constructor. So, so it, it, or I, I probably did, but um, there's no implementation for it, right? So there is a definition for the constructor. Uh, that's that's the, the one and only constructor for the class. It takes a time slice quantum. So basically the, the time slice quantum is fixed for um, the simulation. So once you start a simulation, if you're using a time slice quantum of five, the time slice quantum is always five for all processes all through the simulation. Right? So that means when we construct a simulation, create a simulator object, uh, we give it one parameter, which is the default time slice quantum to use for our round robin scheduling. Right? Um, but um, the the constructor I gave you doesn't do anything. So your task one is you have to actually initialize that. So that just means that um, you know, you're given that as a parameter, but you need to remember that parameter um, in the member variable for the um, the class uh, for your process simulator class, right? So it'll look something like um, 
So again, I usually like to just use the same name and just differentiate by using the this keyword. So uh, this objects um, time slice quantum is being initialized to the time slice Q A T M. By the way, some some people that are um, so, so this initializes this member variable to be um, this value. Um, this passed in as a parameter. Okay. Some people that are familiar with C++ know that there's ways to specify like uh, constructing uh, member variables using like a colon. Um, Uh, and that's perfectly valid to, you, to do that as well if, if you prefer that way. So um, I usually like to just kind of have them explicitly in there. So. Uh, and the other thing, I mean, you can go ahead and change the name of this. So if this bugs you, you can say, um, uh, instead of using this, you know, you can, you can say, change the name of the parameter to um, the, like maybe the init, the initial time slash quantum. And say that the and in this case now we're again we're saying that the time slash quantum, which is the member variable, is equal to the um, initial time slash quantum. Either way, but those should give you the same thing. We're 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 assigning the parameter into the member variable, right? Okay, so that built. Um, and um, if I was to run the test, I, I actually when I built, I hadn't saved my change to that. So, uh, but if we run the test, Control Shift T. Um, Uh, oh, I did save that, so it rebuilt my process simulator there. Um, so yeah, I might have it now passing. So let's go see what we had. Um, I'll scroll up to the top here of the test. So the first failing one was at 156 here. Um, so yeah, it didn't. Um, so yeah, it, it, I hadn't had that that saved in there yet. So, uh, but but it, it is passing all these tests for the process um, and your first failing one should be this. Uh, and then, so, so to get this, um, I think that, uh, yeah, I haven't, or, or uh, you know, maybe we got this incorrectly, but um, I think in this assignment, you also have to implement in step one, these getter methods as well. This is all for practice and to try to help you familiarize yourself with the, uh, the object and the classes here. So let's check that. Um, so if we look for our get time slice, Quantum getter method, probably near the top here. Um, yeah, we're just returning uh, a stub zero, right? All right, so if, if we initialize it in the constructor and if we return it correctly in our getter method, hopefully then now if we rebuild and rerun our test, we'll, we'll be passing the first one of, of our second test case here. So control shift B, um, so I shouldn't have to recompile the tests, so it should be relatively quick. Uh, we'll have to check, I, it shouldn't have to have recompiled the process in the process simulator either. So, um, and then let's run the tests and see what we got. So yeah. So, so, so implementing the constructor and implementing the getter method gets you, so you can pass this one. Um, and uh, then we get the, um, our first failing test is now at 157, get next process ID. So, um, so then, yeah, you should get, do the rest of these getters as well. And, and I'm thinking I'm gonna, right now, I'm just gonna show one more, and then maybe on Monday when I do this again, I might give you all these, right? So, but yeah, this first task is really just to get um, uh, these getter methods working. So, oh, I, but yeah, you, should, you probably need to initialize these as well. So, so you have to initialize these both in the uh, constructor, but uh, so like for the next process ID, so again, the process ID is just kept as, um, uh, let me explain that a little bit. The next process ID, so this might look, you know, we're defining it as a PID type and times the system time and time slash quantums are as time types. Notice I, I, I didn't mention that, I failed to mention that, but I just assigned um, um, that in there. Oh, I noticed there's a bug in there. That should have been the, the time slash quantum is a time, not a PID. So that really should have been time. Should fix that. 
I'll see if I select that in the header too. So if we can distract your hand. Uh, I'll have to fix that. So it's a really time slice compiler. But um, the reason why the compiler didn't complain about those um, is if you look at um, in, oh, it's in the process class. So you have to look in the process header, process.hpp. I think it's in there. So besides the process class, um, We've got a couple of type deaths. Okay, so again, this is this is supposed to be an example of good program practice. So we're really just using ints, or actually unsigned ints, because you know you, you don't. It doesn't really make sense to allow negative, because process identifiers are always like one, two, three, positive numbers, right? So 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 we want to use unsigned ints for process IDs. Likewise, times are always expressed. Um, in, in this case, we don't have the possibility in the simulation of having a negative time, which you know could be valid, but in this case, times are always zero or positive. So 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 but, but both of these are unsigned in, and, that, and that's why it wasn't really complaining that I used a PID instead of a time, even though I define time slice quantum to be a, 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 a of type time, right? But but a type def is just like a, an alias. So PID is an, another name for an unsigned int, and time is just another name for an unsigned int, and event ID is just another name for an unsigned int. Okay. Why we do that? Well, um, one is supposed to to give more of 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 intentionality, the intention of what these are supposed to be. So, so time slash quantums are, are a, a type of time. So, so they represent some time unit in our simulation, uh, as well as system time. Uh, process next, the, the the process IDs is a type of PID. Um, um, so it represents, however, you know, we represents process identifiers. Um, that's what this is, and we're just using integers. But if we wanted to change that. Uh, in theory, we could easily change that by just changing the type def or by adding a new class of type PID. And then we wouldn't have to change anything else, just um, um, how you define what a PID is or, or whatever. So, um, All right, so that's kind of an aside, but that's kind of what's going on with those. So, so like I said, I have to show one more here, and then I'm going to quit for the day. So, for the next process ID, we're expected that the, the system is expected to start counting at process ID of one. Okay, so that means that you really want to initialize. So I guess I guess you have to use this again, or, or you know, I'd, I'd probably be using this, but um, um, you should in initialize the the next process ID be one and, um, and then you have to implement the getter the get that pro next process ID instead of returning the stub to actually return what the next process ID is all right um, and so now if you initialize it to one um, assuming nothing changes that it's going to return one um, or uh, in particular for, for the tests here after calling the constructor, next process ID gets initialized to one. So if we immediately call get next process ID without doing anything, we're expecting the next process ID. So this is going to be the process ID of the, the next process that gets created. It should be assigned a process ID of one here. So that should allow us to pass the first two test cases. And again, you know, don't don't be implementing all five of these getter methods um, and and then doing the test. Do them one by one, so that if you have a typo or something, you, you don't miss it or you don't get confused from having multiple error messages. So. But anyway, that should build hopefully. And um, I had to rebuild the test there again. I don't know why. I didn't, I don't think I maybe accidentally saved there. I didn't mean to, but yeah, that should build. And then, um, assuming I didn't have a typo or something somewhere, it'll run. We should see it get past these first two tests here. So, as I think I described in the um, you know the task one for this um, assignment two, um, in describing the assignment. Um, 
you, you probably want to implement these getter methods, but you probably want to go ahead and just um, stub these out until you get a little bit further along and you're ready to start adding in like a, a queue in order to, to simulate your ready queue, which I didn't give you that. So you're gonna have to implement, you have to add in some kind of a queue. And I'll probably talk more about that on Monday, but you really should not try and do something by hand. You should really use like a, the, the standard template library queues um, or lists or something for these. So if you've never used the standard template library in C++, probably now is the time. You ought to be using that for like a, a, a list. Um, you might want to implement your, um, you might want to implement your, um, your, your list of processes, uh, the, the process, what our textbook calls the process control block. You might want to list, implement that as just a regular array. You could, maybe. So just in a regular, a regular way of, of process types, or maybe a process pointer types if you're, if you're comfortable with doing dynamic memory allocation. So, um, although, again, it might be better, it, it would really be helpful to actually implement that as a standard template library list, maybe, or something like that. So, Okay, we built there, um, and um, I ran the tests, and we're failing. One fifty eight is our first one now, so I would continue on from that point. So I would initialize the system time to start at a system time of one. Um, initialize the number of active processes, the number of finished processes. So before we start the simulation, no processes started, no, none finished. Those are both zero. Um, and like I said, after that, probably what I said in the um, description of task one is you want to stub these out. So you want to um, maybe not initially, you don't need to initialize anything yet until you create like a ready queue and a blocked list or things. Um, but, but you might want to implement these methods um, to, to return back what's expected here and defer doing those till you get um, a little bit further on. So. All right, um, that's it. Uh, like I said, I'll probably repeat all this on Monday and, and, and kind of go a little bit further, um, probably do all that uh, on this first task. And probably also starting Monday and Wednesday, I'm gonna talk some more about the standard template library. If I've got some videos on that if you've never used it. So you really should be using like, um, 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 it's, uh, I'll talk about why it, it, it's, you probably shouldn't use an actual queue. You probably wanna use just a, a plain list for like your uh, ready queue. Um, and you might want to use a list or something more sophisticated for the blocked set of keeping track of the set of block processes. So, um, all right. So yeah, I'm going to stop there. That's it for this video. And uh, as usual, if you have questions, feel free to email them to me with your code or um, or whatever questions in the problem set. Um, and I will see you guys then on our next session.